So uh, good evening and welcome to session two of the challenges of starting in conservation, skills to help students and emerging professionals. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelly Grimshaw and I am the Emerging Professionals representative for the Textiles Committee. I will be your host for this evening's event, which will feature three brilliant presentations of around 15 minutes each. We were planning on having our in-person two-day event in Glasgow for students and emerging professionals this March, but due to COVID-19 and current restrictions, uh, we've decided to postpone this event until March 2022. Nevertheless, the committee still wants to provide an event for those studying and new to the field, as despite COVID, students and emerging professionals like myself are still learning, working and trying to build our careers in conservation. So as a lot of things have turned digital, we thought we could try and produce a taster for what is to come in 2022. And kindly, several of the speakers we have booked for the in-person event have agreed to participate in this two part webinar series. So before we begin, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. As everyone is working on their home Wi-Fi, uh, please bear with us if there are any connections um, or there's any lagging, but hopefully um, we'll have no issues tonight. And also you will have noticed that your cameras and microphones are turned off and they will be throughout tonight's events. Um, also, we have a couple of webinar tips, which we hope will help you interact with us during tonight's. So firstly, we encourage you to use the chat box function as highlighted here um, to say hello and to tell us where you're viewing from. Secondly, um, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, the Q&A function is available. Again, as you can see on here, um, and these will be sent directly to us and uh, they'll be discussed after all three speakers have presented at the end of the session. If you would like to remain anonymous, uh, please just tick the box um, underneath your question. And finally, if you are having any issues uh, with viewing the webinar, um, go to view options at the top of the page and select uh, fit to window. And hopefully um, that will kind of resolve any issues that you're having. And then um, finally, uh, one final point before we begin. Um, we are running our virtual pub, the Needle and Thread, afterwards to carry on the conversation. So I hope to see you all there. And then for those who haven't signed up, we will put the registration link in the chat box soon. Um, so tonight for our speakers, uh, first up tonight is Ariel Jula. So Ariel is a freelance preventive conservator based in Northumberland and works across the north of England and Scotland. After graduating with an MA in Preventive Conservation from Northumbria University in 2017, Ariel completed internships with the Centre for Research Collections at the University of Edinburgh and the National Trust for Scotland. Ariel registered as a sole trader in 2019 and has been pursuing a freelance career throughout the pandemic. Her talk will reflect on this experience and share lessons learned as an early career conservator. So I'll just stop sharing my screen and then over to you, Ariel. Hello, thanks Kelly. Good evening, everyone. I'm just gonna share my, my uh, PowerPoint with you all. So bear with me a second here. Right, there we go. All right, yes, good evening. So I'm Ariel. I'm a freelance preventive conservator. I'm based in Northumberland, as Kelly said. I'm going to chat with you all tonight about my experiences um, post graduating, qualifying, and moving into freelancing and working during the last year in the pandemic. So, a little bit more background. As Kelly mentioned, I graduated in December 2017 with a master's from, in preventive conservation from Northumbria University. I've completed internships with the University of Edinburgh, um, with the National Trust for Scotland, and I recently started a, a 12 week internship with the National Library for Scotland. Um, in November 2019, I set up my freelance business and registered as self-employed. I then spent five to six months building up my portfolio, um, working on projects and creating client relationships um, before the first lockdown in March 2020. Um, and since then, um, I've completed very limited freelance work. So what did that mean? How did lockdown change freelancing for me? So during the first lockdown, I immediately had to reassess priorities and really think about what I wanted to achieve in my freelance work. I had to think about what skills I had to offer. Um, and this might have been the uh, roles and positions that weren't necessarily conservation related, um, but also what skills I wanted to improve on. 
Um, and which networks can I really engage with um, to help me with that? Um, I reassess freelancing as a business model. I went through my finances over the last the first six months of trading and worked out how accurate my estimates were, um, how much I was earning and how much um, I had in savings. Um, there's, as I mentioned, there's very little freelance work available in the first lockdown. And obviously that was a big impact on reassessing freelancing as a business. And then I took all that and started to learn how to operate in the new normal as everyone else did. But really um, took time to think what it meant to be a freelancer during lockdown. So I'll talk a bit more about finances. I'm quite happy to be open about this in the chat and questions afterwards as well. But as I newly registered as self-employed, I didn't qualify for any government assistance. Um, didn't qualify for the um, uh, self-employed income assistance scheme. And I couldn't go on furlough because you can't furlough yourself when you're self-employed. Um, I work and contracts or um, quotes that I had sent out to clients before lockdown were either immediately canceled or postponed um, with no end date in sight during the first lockdown. Um, and this meant I had to rely really heavily on savings from previous employment and projects and family support. Um, I successfully received two emergency relief grants from nonprofit organizations in the arts and heritage sector, which made a huge difference. Um, but also to say I applied for several other grants unsuccessfully. So it's definitely um, trial by error there. So I also spent a lot of time really pursuing different types of opportunities. So this meant applying for jobs, roles and grants, even things that didn't seem a direct fit for my experiences or as a conservator. Um, I really focused on building connections with professionals across the wider arts and heritage sector in similar situations, so other freelancers, other people who are self-employed. Um, and I spent a lot of time also responding to calls for papers, surveys and webinars to stay engaged in the sector. Um, a bonus over the last year was I was able to attend a lot more professional development than I previously planned. Um, especially as a freelancer, because as we've all found out, a lot of events um, that might have been too expensive or too difficult to attend suddenly became either free or um, with very little cost because I didn't have to travel um, and stay overnight anywhere. And this also allowed me time to explore um, perspectives across the sector and attend events I might not have even thought of attending before. I also had to become more adept at asking for and offering help. Um, really trying to find resources and communities that offered advice and support, um, again, wider than just the conservation network that we know of. Um, I've listed a couple here that I found particularly useful last year, um, Museums Freelance, um, Fair Museum Jobs, and the Northeast Cultural Partnership, obviously kind of based in Northumberland. But these, again, are all nonprofit organizations um, run by a really great um, group of people, really passionate and dedicated to arts and heritage and offering support and advice for everyone. I spent a lot of time following up with contacts that I made in my internships and my other work. And I was really open with them, um, asking for advice on job opportunities or advice on funding applications I went for and um, just seeing where I could find help and, and maintaining connections. And I mentioned this before, but keeping involved in tasks and roles that supported the wider sector, the wider arts and heritage sector. So I know um, Museum Freelance did a, a large piece of survey work to try to get a glance of how um, freelancers across the sector were faring during a lockdown. They actually used that to lobby government and other agencies for funding, which is really great. So it's really important to, to support that. Um, and I also spent some time attending online socials and meetups, again, to try to connect with colleagues across the sector. Um, I, the Northeast Cultural Partnership was really great for that to meet um, similar cultural freelancers in, in Northumberland, the Northeast of England for me. And so what it was like when I actually got to work on site during COVID, um, there was a few times I, I got to visit clients and do some survey work, um, and it was very different, I'm sure, as everyone knows, but it's also maintaining this client relationship. So sort of adapting your working patterns to the client um, working restrictions, what they had set out in their health assessments and their assumptions. And so for me, this meant um, there might be limits in staff numbers in offices and having to match my days on site with staff rotas having to work out protocols that were put in place for sanitizing shared spaces, like kitchens, canteens, and toilet facilities. Also trying to maintain social distancing while working as a contractor. So balancing the need to be escorted on site while also maintaining our distance and keeping our masks on. And we're definitely not able to solo work um, anywhere. 
And also just in terms of equipment, needing to remember not only to be my conservation tools, but all my PPE that was acquired for during COVID, you know, additional masks, extra pairs of gloves, um, you know, sanitizing gel to keep in back pocket, um, and all my refreshments, even on coffee, my own coffee flask, because you couldn't necessarily rely on being able to share um, uh, mugs and things in shared kitchens. And also a really important aspect of this was allowing myself time to have fun and explore my creativity. I think it's really important to make time for that, to pursue hobbies, to explore your creativity and try something new. It's really important to give yourself a break and to realize it's okay to have fun. So I started planning for whatever I call my days off. I didn't work towards conservation. I didn't attend seminars. I didn't go online and I would just do a jigsaw puzzle, watch Netflix and just let myself have some of that mental and emotional break that I think everybody needs. But just looking further ahead, and what does this mean for freelancing in the future? Um, I will say Phil's freelancing is starting to come back a little bit, although I don't think it's anywhere near pre-pandemic levels, um, but I wouldn't expect to be just in 12 months. Um, I feel like some of the restructuring that organizations have gone through um, could change how they use freelancers in the future. It feels like opportunities are still fairly rare and not always transparent. Um, some institutions don't advertise that they use freelancers. Um, so how are you know? How do you know where to apply or who to contact if they're not um, openly advertised or tendered? Um, and also, has how do institutions plan for freelance work going forward? And do they talk to the current um, roster of freelancers and have them part of the conversation? And I guess this all comes down to is freelancing. I'm still viable in the long term as a route into the profession, the sector. Um, I'm not really sure. I don't have answers to the questions, but these are the things that um, keep me going and keep me um, pursuing the, the opportunities and, and the conversations. So I've put my email address at the bottom and my Twitter handle. So if anybody wants to get in touch um, after this for um, a chat or questions or any advice that I may or may not be able to offer, I'm more than happy to, to stay in touch. Um, and just really keep positive and everyone stay safe and, you know, join the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel. That was informative and definitely during this current climate, it was interesting definitely to hear a perspective of somebody going through it. Um, so I would just uh, say to everybody that uh, we will have all questions at the end. So um, do keep your questions coming in um, and then we'll compile them and uh, have them at the end with when everybody's present after all presentations. Um, so we'll move on uh, to the next presentation, um, which is with uh, Julie Bond. So Julie is an accredited conservator who joined the National Library of Scotland as head of collections care in May, 2019. She manages a team of conservators, technicians, preservation assistants, registrar, audit officer, and interns based across two sites in Edinburgh. Qualifying with an MA Conservation of Historic Objects from the University of Lincoln in 2004, Julie held a number of project jobs before being appointed as a regional conservator for the National Trust for Scotland in 2006. In that role, she delivered preventive conservation advice and project management across a number of historic properties and managed a nationwide project to deliver emergency response and salvage plans for over 50 historic sites with collections. She was accredited through ICON in 2013 and is an accreditation mentor and assessor. She sits on the ICON's accreditation committee representing conservation management and preventive conservation and is a guest lecturer at the CTC at Glasgow University. So over to you, Julie. Thanks, Kelly. Hopefully you can see this all right. I, I admit I was just chucked out of the Zoom meeting and have, have had a mad panic trying to get back in. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try and not move or make any sudden movements or anything. Hopefully you can see that okay. Excellent. So I just wanted to um, say thank you very much for the invitation to speak to everyone today and, and thanks for that. Great introduction, Kelly. Um, today I'm going to talk about applying for jobs and internships. So I think it's important to think about where you are, where's your starting point. And I know a number of you will be studying right now and a number of you have finished studying and you're looking for jobs. 
but it's worth thinking about where you are and what your what your focus is right now. If you're studying, then your focus should be your your studies and um, and making the most of those opportunities that are presented to you. But sometimes it can be difficult to sit back and and take a look at the bigger picture and see uh, and see what's ahead of you and and where you fit within that. So I think it's important to keep in mind at all times during your career, no matter at what stage you're at, um, where are you and where are you headed? What are your ambitions? Where is it that you want to be? And, and how are you going to get there? What's the path that you can follow? What are the skills or the experience gaps that you perhaps identify that you have? And how are you going to go about filling them? And in order to do this, you have to be self-reflective and able to assess where you are and where you want to be. So I think there's importance to think about what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And one way, one helpful way of doing this is to look at the <clears throat> ICON accreditation standards, our own professional standards within the sector. So I'm sure you're all very well familiar with the professional standards. Um, these are the standards that we should all be measuring ourselves against at all points in our career. Um, they lay out the professional standards that we, that we should be um, aiming for. They were developed in 1999 and they were reviewed in 2007, 2013 and again last year in 2020. And they really stand up to, to close scrutiny and they really can help you to, to work out exactly where you are on a scale uh, and, and make you think about all the elements of your professional practice that you should be working on and developing on. So in terms of aiming for accreditation, which is the ACR baseline, you have to prove yourself to be proficient at all of the standards and judgment and ethics. And so accreditation is a peer reviewed system um, and usually this typically can take between four and five years following, following the completion of a training course in conservation. You might find yourself ready for accreditation and, and ticking the boxes against proficient um, in all of these areas. Everyone's diff different, so you know, four to five years is not a, a hard and fast rule. It takes some of us much longer and some people are ready much, much faster than that. So that is, it is just a guide. But it's important to, to be aware of this and to to be able to think and reflect on where you are now and where you're aiming to be and how you're going to get there. So typically when graduating for a con from a conservation training course, you might find yourself somewhere like this. This might be the picture that reflects where you are against the, the professional standards. You can see you've got a good grounding in the basics through your, through your um, training and you're beginning to move through the through the the phases of progression towards proficiency but you're not there yet you've got a lot that you need to focus on you've got a lot of areas that you want to develop in some of these areas you may you may well be um competent at this point depending on the route that you've taken through your training um you may have you may be a career change and so you may feel you have strengths in in organization and management which might boost you up in some ways but I think this is a sort of fair reflection. And I think what I'm trying to get across here is that this is fine. This is OK. Um, this is where you, you, you should be and, and that you should be comfortable with, with that and be honest with yourself about that as well. So I wanted to let you see maybe what the picture might be if you were emerging after um, a 12 month internship. So something where you are getting training on the job, you're getting great work experience, you're working with other professionals, you're learning from them. And this is what you might come out with at the end of, of an internship. And uh, if you're working through an ICON internship, the activity monitor that, that runs alongside that internship will help you to, to see where you fit against these standards and see how you're developing against them. But again, this is something that might be typical. You might have had some experience um, of, of conservation options and strategies and some experience of actually carrying out conservation treatment. So again, standards two and three, you might, you might be moving into competent and um, you might be 
fairly autonomous in what you're doing, but still guided by your supervisor and guided by those that you work with. So you can see that you can see the development and the opportunities potentially that a uh, conservation training internship could bring for you. So thinking about your career path and, and what's next, um, where, where are you going to go? What are the next steps for you? As I say, it can be useful to reflect on where you are and, and understand the, the route that you might take next. You might think it's a luxury to think in those terms, um, whether you've got the, the opportunity to choose, whether it's employment or internship. And I know that the sector is, is struggling at the moment, like, like so many different professions. This, these are unprecedented times, and I know that doesn't make it any easier. But I think these are opportunities for, for self-reflection and for thinking and for planning ahead for your career and understanding really what it is that, that you value, what it is that's important to you. So it can, be important, it can be useful to think about the differences between what the next steps might be. So would it be employment or internship? They're not the same thing. And it's important to recognize the differences between them. So if we're thinking about employment as the next step, what might employers look for that a trainee or an intern host isn't necessarily looking for? In essence, employers are looking for someone who can deliver the goods. It's all about getting a job done. So we can look at it um, against these, these headings. Employers are certainly looking for a match with the job, job description. I, I read lots of job, uh, I write job descriptions and I read lots of applications. And, and this is where I'm coming from with what I'm, what I'm sharing with you here is, is my experience of, of looking for that match um, and, and how people come across in applications and, and tick all the boxes that I'm looking for. Certainly there's something about fit in the team and the organization and employers looking for that. They're looking for someone who'll fit in with the, the other personalities in the team, maybe fill a gap in terms of experience that's not already on the team. And, and someone that's just going to get in there and, and work well with others. So that's a key point when thinking about applications and interviews in terms of team working. There's always going to be some element of that. Employers are looking for someone with a reasonable degree of autonomy. So you have to be able to show that you can work unsupervised, that you have skills and experience that you can get a job done, that you don't need um, someone telling you what the next step in a treatment is um, all the way through. You can make your own decisions, you know what you're doing, you look for advice and you speak to people when you need to, but, but you are able to, to carry through the work that would be expected of you. Certainly, an employer is looking for enthusiasm and interest in the job. Um, you've got to be able to demonstrate that, and I don't doubt that, that you all are able to do that. Um, we, we come to conservation for the love of it. We don't come for, for the kudos or the status or the flash car or, or the, the huge salary, none of that. We all come because of the enthusiasm and the, the interest that we have for, for the subject matter. So I'm sure you'd be able to demonstrate that, but it's good for you to know that that is what employers are looking for. But again, it comes down to this fact that employers are looking for someone who can deliver the job and get the work done. On the flip side, what are intern hosts looking for? And again, as Kelly mentioned, I, I, um, I'm involved in, in hosting internships. Um, we, have, we have two at the National Library at the moment. moment. We have a fragile formats intern with us for nine months, and we have a preventive conservation intern with us for three months. And you've just heard from her, Ariel. So what are we looking for when we're looking for an, an intern? Well, again, we're looking for a match with the placement description. We're looking for someone who ticks the boxes in terms of the experience that, that we're asking for and that we're looking for, which will not be the same um, experience that's expected um, for a job. But there will still be an expectation that there is some theoretical knowledge and, and experience um, in there somewhere. Again, fit in the team and the organisation, that's really important and you'll never get away from that. Um, interns, employer, employees, whichever way, um, you have to fit within the team. Again, you'll see that enthusiasm and interest is there. Very, very important to be able to express that when, when applying for an internship. 
But here we get into some of the key differences, I would say, um, in terms of what an intern host is looking for from a candidate. They're looking for an applicant that will get the most out of the opportunity. That really, can be really, really difficult um, to, demonstrate, to demonstrate that. But you have to be able to think clearly about what the placement means to you, what you think you'll learn from it, and how you see this fitting into your career path. Absolutely, that's what intern hosts will, will look for. They will look for someone who understands what an internship is, understands that it's a step between training and employment. It's an opportunity to learn and get the most out of, of the experience. And you have to be able to very clearly articulate that um, when you're going through the process of applying for an internship. So I think it helps just to make a, a comparison there. Um, to summarise, you might not be able to make a choice. Um, you might just be looking for any opportunity that is available, but you should think about the level of job that, that's right for you at the moment, what you should be aiming for and, and what you might need to do to get it. So how do you demonstrate all of this? And again, I've just highlighted some of these things that I think are quite important when it comes to thinking about the differences. In employment, you will be working to an organisational plan, there will be a strategy, there will be in-house standards that you have to work for, and there'll be objectives that you have to meet. And that will be assessed through an annual appraisal system of some sort. But you carry the responsibility for the reputation of the organisation and the team as an employee. And I would say in most cases, there would be an expectation that, that you would be working towards accreditation and demonstrating that in some way. Whereas with an internship, there is the opportunity for more research and study and open door when it comes to networking. My experience of working with interns is that um, everyone in the sector is so generous when it comes to working with interns that, that they'll, they'll speak to you about anything, they'll help you with your research, they'll, when, when it's allowed, they'll welcome you with open arms into their studio to see what they do. So internships really are a unique opportunity when it comes to networking. But you'll see there's some similarities there in terms of the responsibility that you, that you carry for the organisation and also for the funder for the internship. Also, always, always make, make a point of looking into who's funding the internship and, and make sure you do your research around that as well. So you've, uh, you've been job hunting, you're, you're looking for opportunities, you've, you've seen the perfect opportunity and you need to make an application. So I'm going to offer some tips and hints for making either applications for jobs or internships. So here, here are my top tips. Um, when you're making an application, it's absolutely essential that you read all the information that you're given in advance, be that a job description, placement description, person specification, read, read, read. All the answers are there. When, a, when an employer is looking to, to match against um, applications, they will sit with the job description, they will sit with your application, and they will cross-reference and tick off. So if you can tick off all the boxes, you're, you're in with a great shout of getting an interview. Research. You must research the organisation that you're applying for. Try and research um, the the line manager or the supervisor, if names are given, look them up, see what you can learn about them. Research around the area, the project, the topic, if it's an internship that's got a clear focus, make sure you do your research around that. Request, I would, I would ask you to think about requesting information. If you have a particular question in advance of, of making an application, Sometimes name recognition is a helpful thing. Um, I have had the experience of had it, having hundreds of applications for one job and a name springs out, out at me for some reason and then I, I realise it's because I was sent an email by said person to ask a question about the application and then the name just stuck in my head. So it can be a useful thing but you do have to be quite careful about that because you can imagine if someone, if an employer has put out a job and then gets hundreds of these emails in advance, then that dilutes it. So um, you do have to be quite careful about that, but consider that as an option. Make sure you've got your referees lined up 
Make sure you check in with them regularly and you keep them up to date as to what you're doing and what you're applying for. Just make sure they're ready to be there for you when you need them. Make sure you think about good examples. Have examples of teamwork. You will always be asked about teamwork. <clears throat> Have examples of <clears throat> different projects that you've worked on, but always remember the role that you've played in that project. You have to express the role that you've played, not that we did this, we did that. It's what did you do part of that team. <clears throat> tailor, make sure you tailor your application to the job that you're applying for. Pull out the experience that you have that is more relevant. Try and make sure that it comes across very clearly in your application that you are applying for this particular job. We will spot a copy and paste a mile off, so just don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, please make sure you tailor your application. Think about gaps that you might have in your CV or your experience. Um, try and be as honest as you can with, with, with gaps. Um, if you had time out for family reasons, just say that and just make that clear. Generalizations, please try and avoid them. The number of times I've read, I am really passionate about X. If you're really passionate about something, demonstrate that to me in a more meaningful way because it just I just skip over that when it comes to that sort of language. So be very careful about the, the language that you use and be as specific as you can. Make a draft of your application, check it. Make a final draft of your application, check it. Get someone else to check it. Read it out loud, see if it makes sense. Then check and double check again. And please really make sure that you're not making spelling mistakes, especially when it comes to people's names. Don't get that wrong, because that will just put you to the bottom of the queue straight away. Right, so you've made your killer application, you've been successful, you've got an interview. What happens next? Here are my top tips for interviews. They're, they're not, it's not rocket science. Preparation, preparation. You do all the work um, with your application. You've got a lot of research there. Make sure you think it through. Um, read through everything that you've put together, read through your application so that you've got examples ready to go for all of these questions that are likely to come up. But don't over prepare. You want to still be you and you want to be spontaneous enough that you can have a regular conversation as much as that is possible within an interview situation. Nerves. We all get them. We all have them. Uh, interviewing as an employer is quite a nerve wracking experience. So, so be aware of that. Everyone's feeling the nerves at the whole time. It's how you manage them um, and, and put them to good use. Use that nervous energy in a good way. Timing. Make sure you keep on top of that. Make sure you get in the information that you want to get in. Shoehorn it into the first question if there's something that you desperately want to talk about. If there's a perfect project that you worked on that, that shows everything you need for this job, Make sure you get it in there as soon as you can because you may not get another opportunity and the time might disappear. So just be very, very careful when it comes to that. Questions, make sure you have a few ready at the end um, to show your interest in the job. Think about it, you're, you're being interviewed for a job but, but you're making a decision as well whether this is the job for you. So take the time to ask the questions. Portfolio time, think about that. You will not have long, so you have to make the most of it. You have to pick out the best ones, the most relevant ones for that job and make sure you focus on those. Wanting the job, try and express that. Try and be enthusiastic. Try and, try and let the employer know that you're really, really keen and that you, that you, that you want the job. Um, and that end of interview moment, think about that. Think about how you're gonna sign off. Think about that last impression that you're gonna leave. Um, with, with the interviewers. So keep moving, what's next? You have to keep moving, you have to keep focusing on, on the future. Once you've graduated and you're job hunting, you'll need to think about your future plans. Everything that I've said, keep it in mind. Think about accreditation. Um, think, about, think about what you can demonstrate that you can do. All the experience that you have, pull it into, into handy examples that, that you can use for, for different interview situations. And think about all the qualities and skills that you have that, that you need to bring to that employer. Remember that there are resources to, to help you. I'm really gonna push the ICON pathway at the moment. I think that's an excellent way um, to, to 
demonstrate your commitment and uh, employers will be impressed when they see that. And also it brings you a lot of benefits if you're on the, on the pathway. Not least the opportunity to hook up with a mentor and I can't uh, recommend that highly enough. Uh, I think we should all have mentors no matter what stage we are in our career. Mentors are, are fantastic. Join groups, do your networking. You're all doing that tonight. So good on you, keep, keep going with that. Consider your portfolio, make sure you're, you're pulling that together and it's ready to go quickly for, for interview opportunities. And remember your CPD. I know Patrick's gonna talk about that a bit more, but it's not just a means to an end. Um, it, it, is, it is worthwhile and it broadens out your horizons. So remember to focus on that and do stay in touch. With, with your network as you as you develop. That's all I had to say, so thank you very much. One very quick thing I would like to say, I should have said at the start that a lot of this presentation is based on work done by uh, a colleague of mine, Carol Brown. So I just wanted to mention that, but thank you. Thank you, G, that was amazing. So much information in there and I've definitely taken a lot of notes myself. So I'm hoping that everyone else has as well. Um, again, any questions for Julie, just pile them into the Q&A and we'll fire them at the end um, once Patrick's spoken um, and then we'll get a discussion with everybody. So uh, we'll move on to our final speaker for tonight and um, it's Patrick White and he is the Training and Development Manager for the Institute of Conservation. Uh, he started his career working in urban regeneration and community development, providing support to third sector organisations and delivering projects across the UK. He subsequently moved into the further education sector where he was responsible for the management of EU and government funded entry to employment programmes and apprenticeships. At ICON, uh, Patrick oversees the delivery of ICON accreditation, the ICON internship programme, the development of training and the provision of early career support and guidance. So, uh, without further ado, over to you, Patrick. Excellent. I'll just sort out my screen. So hello, my name is Patrick Wythe. I'm the Training and Development Manager at the Institute of Conservation. And I'm really pleased to have been invited here to speak today about planning your professional journey from emerging professional to accredited conservator. So through the talk, I want to give you a whistle stop overview of the steps you can do to take control of your CPD and to ultimately support you on your journey to becoming an accredited member of ICOM. Through this session, I'll touch on how to consider where you want to get to, um, think about what your journey could look like, ensuring you understand your level of skills and practice, and effectively planning your continuing professional development, and of course, accessing support and guidance along the way. So first off, where do you want to get to? So in order to become an accredited member of ICON, you need to show how you're working to the ICON professional standards at the proficient level. What this means is, is that you will be an experienced professional who routinely makes good conservation decisions, is able to deal with complex projects and able to draw out your autonomy in your decision making where relevant. Accreditation isn't just about an elite group of practitioners, rather it's there to ensure that all professional conservators, regardless of their background or area of practice, are working to the same high standards. So breaking this down, this is about knowledge, um, your depth of understanding of your discipline and area of practice, the standard of your work, so fully achieving a fully acceptable standard routinely, your autonomy, so being able to take full responsibility for your own work and that of others where applicable, within the scope of your role, of course. Complexity, so dealing with complex situations holistically and confidently. And finally, context, so seeing the overall picture and how your individual actions fit within that. This is based on the Novice to Expert scale, which we've got here. This outlines the different levels of professional practice. There is also an expert level which isn't shown here as it isn't relevant to the accreditation process. So if we start from the beginning, so we have 
novice, so those just starting out their training, qualified or beginners, so those who've just completed their training, competent, so those with a few years experience, and then finally proficient. So those practitioners who may you know, have around five or more years experience. With all this, there isn't a right or wrong place to be. Um, many people, even sort of experienced conservators, will of course have areas where they're stronger at than others. Um, but this is the, an introduction to the scale against which icon accreditation is assessed. And it might seem very daunting and you might not know where to start. However, there really isn't a right or wrong way. But importantly, now you have an idea of where you want to get to, now you can start thinking about planning your journey to that. It's inevitable that we all have to follow the opportunities as they arise, particularly when opportunities might be more limited you know, at the moment. However, don't let that put you off planning. There are lots of things that you can be doing to develop your professional skills. So this is my first real message and what I'm going to run through for the rest of the talk, which is fundamentally about taking control of your own professional development. When thinking about your professional development, remember that it's about you, so your personal professional development and not that of your employer or your workplace. It's a holistic process, so it doesn't just relate to your conservation practice, but to the wider skills which make you a conservation professional. It's variable, so the steps you take to develop your practice may vary depending on the resources you have available, your preferred learning style, and very practically what it is that you feel you need to learn or what skill you feel you need to develop. And finally, it's reflective. So what this means is it's built on what you've learnt in the past and what works best for you now. So if we start going through from the beginning, the first thing you should be doing is to assess where you are now. This means that you should take time to first go through the professional standards, that's your goal after all, and work out where you are. So thinking about the projects you've worked on as a student, as a volunteer or through work, and try and think about what standards you've addressed through these projects. You could use the self-assessment form on the ICON website to help you do this, or you might find your own way of doing it. But do spend time going through it and trying to think about all of your different experiences. Don't worry if they're not the perfect projects at this stage. This is about thinking where you are now and whether there are gaps that you think need filling. Once you've done this, you could then take a look at the Novice to Expert scale and start thinking about what level you may be practicing at. Really don't worry if you're a novice or a beginner in some areas. It's very likely to have just been down to the opportunities you've had. I think the important thing is that you're honest and obviously, obviously not overly harsh. Um, and that will really help you find where you need to develop and where you should be focusing your efforts. Recognising certainly that there'll be stronger areas than others. So the next step is to plan. So once you have an idea of where you are, the next step is going to be to think about what do I need to do to get there? I'd suggest using the CPD log, which is on the ICON website, to start thinking about what your goals should be. So for ICON members, this is in your My Member area, and it's a resource for you to go and upload your CPD goals. You can save and you can come back to them, and you could even print them off if you want. If you're not a member, you can do something similar, but I'd say make sure you're writing down your goals. I think that's a really important thing. And these, of course, should take into account what I was speaking about before, about your goals and plans being tailored to your own particular needs and the resources you have available. For example, as well as attending a course, you could be thinking about identifying opportunities where you could talk to your manager about getting exposure to a certain type of project or making the time to network and talk to other colleagues. Do spend time to do this and this will help you in setting your goals. I mean, for the best of us, if we don't set goals and plans, things can often drift. So do spend time doing this. The next step is, of course, to make sure you take the time to follow up on your plans. Um, however, of course, you've got to accept that plans do change and what once was possible might no longer be feasible. Over the last year, that's certainly been the case for everyone. If so, reevaluate. you know, is there something else I could do? Or think, is this still a need for me to develop? 
Um, and if not, well, that's fine. You can move on to the next thing. Or do you need to do it in a different way that does fit within your resources at the moment? But if you've done the planning and you've set yourself dates and targets, hopefully this will help you make sure you follow through on your CPD plans. Finally, reflect and repeat. So thinking about what you've just done, did it work? Was it the best thing for you to do? Do you need to do anything else? CPD doesn't stop and all professionals are required to show a good grasp of their own professional development. So this isn't just for you as emerging professionals, all practicing professional conservators should be taking a strong grasp of their own CPD needs um, to keep on top with techniques and importantly to make sure that they're continuing to work to the same high standards. So now you've got a good grasp of your CPD, well what could your professional journey look like? As I said, everyone's going to be different, but here I've outlined a five-year plan. For some it may be shorter, for many it may take a little bit longer. But if I just start running through, so in year one, um, this would be about assessing where you are, so taking the time out to do that self-assessment, identifying your practice against the standards and the novice to expert scale and start considering what gaps you have and how you might go about filling them. You could also consider joining the pathway um, to access the support of a professional mentor to help you do this. Years two and three, this would probably be much more of the same, you know, thinking about your practice and actioning your CPD goals and reflecting on what new goals and targets you should be setting yourself. Thinking with the standards in the back of your mind will really help you to make sure you're focused on filling these gaps to ensure you're developing professionally. By the time you get to year four, you'll be thinking about starting to write your application or at least parts of it. It's likely that by this time you'll have some good projects that you can draw from. You might also consider taking the time to come to an accreditation workshop and really start focusing on accreditation with your mentor. And leading into year five, where you'd be aiming to go through the accreditation process. As I've said several times, no journey is going to be the same. And if it takes longer, that's fine. It's really likely going to be down to the opportunities you've had to get experience with the right projects. But hopefully, with your now strong ownership of your continuing professional development needs, you'll be on top of this. But as I sort of come to the end today, I just want to give you an overview of the support that is available to you to help you in becoming an accredited member of ICON, should you choose to do so, some of which I'd mentioned, but no matter how early in your journey you are, I think you'll find this useful. So first off, if you're a Pathway member, there's access to mentors. So we have around 80 accredited conservators who are available to first help you with your professional development and then supporting you very practically with going through the accreditation process. We have guides and example applications on the ICON website, and I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be looking at this information now, so you have an idea of what it is you're trying to achieve. There are workshops and training sessions where we run through everything in a lot more detail and we go very practically go through the application and assessment process and outline the other support that's available to you. And of course, there's, you know, we're here the whole time, sort of us and the professional development team and my other colleagues to provide you with advice and support. So I think if you have any questions, just get in touch and we're really happy to help in any way we possibly can. So if, sort of coming towards the end, just here are some resources that you will hopefully find helpful that I've been running through today. So we've got the CPD log, which is in your members area. Um, we have the ICON Professional Standards and the self-assessment form and our email address, so accreditation at icon.org.uk. Do just drop us a line um, if you have any questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I think, uh, why don't we bring everyone back on? I know there's some questions have piled up. Um, and because I know a little short on time, I want to get in as many as possible. 
Um, so I just want to say thank you to all of you. Um, I've definitely learned a lot and I'm hoping others have as well. Um, but if we start, so um, Ariel, the first question is for you from um, Aurora and she's asked, uh, what made you want to become a freelance conservator? Oh, that's a good one. Well, it's sort of two part. I just finished um, the internship with the National Trust for Scotland involved a really intense year of um, working and traveling a lot and being away from home a lot. So I wanted some more flexibility in my work practice to be able to have a bit more downtime. But also the another major reason is there were no jobs in my specialism or in my geographical area that I could apply for. Uh, I'm not in a position to necessarily relocate. Um, I have a partner who has a permanent job in Northumberland. So I was very limited on opportunities in that sense as well. But I think freelancing gave me a chance to keep um, increasing my skills and making contacts um, while I while I um, also continue job searching. Amazing, thank you. Um, and there's one uh, uh, from an anonymous attendee, and I guess it could apply to, to all of you. Um, how would you maintain connections in a meaningful way? And I guess that's kind of ever more prevalent at the moment without being able to obviously meet with people. But I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think networks are really important, especially especially now when we're so disconnected. Um, so I think it is important to try and keep in touch with people, whether that be um, your fellow students, uh, whether that's your um, tutors, whether it's people you've worked with. Um, I mean, I guess LinkedIn is a good way of, of meeting people. And, and I always say to the students at Glasgow when I speak to them, look me up on LinkedIn afterwards, please. I expect I expect you to, <laughs> to connect with me on, in that way. So, you know, I think I think there's different ways that you can do it. And obviously it's it's not the way that we would want to be connected at the moment in terms of seeing people face to face. But yeah, we should all be there for each other. It's It's hard. So we do need to support each other. Yeah, I would agree with that. I use LinkedIn a lot. Um, I even post about projects and research ideas I have um, and people respond really quickly. Um, uh, another thing I sort of was thinking about last year when I was freelancing is trying to keep in touch with clients and people I've worked with, but in a meaningful way as the person asks, it's, I didn't feel it'd be very helpful if I was just constantly emailing people asking for work because that's not really very useful. If everyone else is stressed or furloughed, it's not really a good way to maintain your relationships. So I kind of went back um, to different uh, contexts and asked really specific questions. So if I knew somebody had uh, experience in a funding application, working on applications, I would ask them to have a chat with me about that. Or um, I sent a bunch of um, New Year's cards, not Christmas cards, New Year's cards, to people I worked with who had helped me in the previous year just to say thank you really looking for, for 2021 and hopefully we can all have more positive future together. Just in little ways to sort of keep engaging with people, but without feeling like I was, I don't want to say bothering them, but without like necessarily asking for something in return. So having like a meaningful way, a meaningful reason to get in touch with people, I guess what I was trying. And then not be shy about asking people for help or just, you know, saying you have a question, because even if it's just a quick email, it doesn't always have to be a chat, um, just to let people know that you're there and you're working on things as well. I think I found it useful. Brilliant. Um, there's another one here um, from Alicia and said, what would you recommend for preparation and experiences for a chemistry PhD interested in breaking into the field as a conservation scientist? I would say talk to people. I would say I would say talk to people, reach out to people, look at the uh, members of the Heritage Science Network, get in touch with the members of the sort of Icon Science Group as well and to look out and network for opportunities. I think speak to someone first. You know, you don't, I suppose you don't necessarily know all the details that the roles could entail, but I think it's that sort of, it's getting on the phone, it's connecting with people on LinkedIn as we were just talking about. But, you know, people are so generous with their time. So I think, you know, I've been having coffees with like colleagues in different organizations, but for catch-ups, it doesn't have to be very formal. And I think if people were very willing to do that stuff, so I think reach out to them. Um, but yeah, definitely look at the sort of Heritage Science Network, National Heritage Science Forum, and other organisations. Um, I sort of reach out to those people. They've all got their members sort of listed. Um, yeah. Good advice, I think. Um, and then kind of that ties in. Um, 
uh, also know I'm from Aurora and, and they've asked, um, where are good places to look for internships and work placements and are they advertised online or is it best to contact organisations directly? It's a mixed bag. I mean, online mm -hmm. is definitely, you know, anyone who's anyone's online. So so there should be opportunities there. I mean, I, Icon is great for, for um, advertising opportunities. I guess in terms of speaking from my experience in terms of student placements or volunteer placements at the library, we don't advertise those. Um, and that's more because I haven't quite worked out how to do that yet. I don't have a clear plan for that. So it's a bit more first come first serve, a little bit more ad hoc. So I wouldn't say don't contact organisations that you are interested in working for or, or volunteering for because there may there may just be an opportunity that hasn't quite formulated yet so I think but I do think be careful and be selective about who you're being in who you're in contact with um again but the the, the name recognition thing can be useful from that point of view too yeah, I would agree with you. I think it's very mixed. I think if you're really interested in an organization, the website is the first place to go because some institutions have dedicated um, volunteer um, managers or volunteer administrators who actually run volunteer programs and they will be listed as contactable. Um, and some places offer placements and internships um, yearly. I know the VNA used to, when I was a student years ago, um, offered um, dedicated placements every summer and you could apply at a timetable and it's very articulated. Um, and also there's lots of mailing lists. Um, the old DIS list is a good one. I think that's now run by FAIC. Um, that's um, international, but lots of UK institutions will list internships. I think a short um, remote internship was just advertised a week or two ago for the University of Edinburgh. Um, again, I hadn't seen advertised anywhere else. Um, and yeah, I'm just getting in touch with people really interested in what you said. Um, I thought I've got a question for Patrick. I've, um, I know I've had a few people ask me as well about with CPD. Mm. Uh, and it's always that, I know there's no definite answer, but it's how much you kind of expected to do a year. And I know when it comes to accreditation and um, mm. to keep up your professional development, sort of how much is expected I guess in a way. Well we don't have um, like other professional bodies say so you have to do 20 hours a year so you've got to do what is right for what you need and that's what you need to show us so you might not have to do a lot you know in a particular year and what you do might just be you know talking and networking necessarily so it's, it's really difficult to say you must do this number of courses or anything like that. I think what we want to see from our accredited members and people going through the accreditation process is that you understand what your needs are first and foremost, and then they're doing something about it, which is this thing about, you know, going through the standards, you know, as I was talking about. Um, so a sort of half answer. <laughs> How I expected something. <laughs> You know, as you say, some bodies, there's a particular like set hours or you need to yeah. show so much, but it's nice to know that there's that flexibility um, mm. with that. Can I just jump in on that? Just, yeah, just to say that um, I totally agree, Patrick. And I think it's a very personal thing. So it, as Patrick says, it has to it has to be what you need it to be. And I think having looked at CPD plan, the strongest ones are those that are really honest and self-reflective and, and often quite specific in the areas that they want to to develop and focus on rather than being sort of I need to know about you know a particular type of textile mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I mean it, it's much more it's much more specific and personal to the person so definitely um and I guess while we're kind of on that topic um, with, you know, ICON and CPD and things, um, Patrick, I don't know if you could share about the current ICON student memberships and mentor grant scheme, as I know that was recently advertised as well. Um, it was. Um, yeah, so this is for current students. Um, we have a grant to support 25 new members or current members apply by the 6th of April. And what that'll do is give you access to work with a mentor um for sort of a fixed period of sort of three to four months um 
I imagine it's going to be very popular. I think it's a really good opportunity to make the most of. So these are going to be really focused on broader professional development. So this isn't, you know, jamming accreditation down your throat, you know, too early, but it's a really good resource. So I would definitely recommend looking at the information. It's in the grants and opportunities page on our website with the sort of full application form and details. So yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Um, there's a few more questions I want to try to get in before we finish, if that's okay. There's one that I think is quite relevant to now, um, and it was directed to you, Ju, but also to all the panelists, if there's any other thoughts. And about, um, you mentioned this slightly about touching on ways to address and talking about um, a period of job searching, unemployment, especially now as things are so limited, as they go and say, um, how, like, how likely are employers to hold it against you as um, they themselves recently graduated um, and getting interviews regularly, but there's no work and they just kind of wanted to, to know how to say it really. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I you know, my heart goes out to you guys because it, it is tough. And I, you know, I don't think we, no one's experienced this. So my sense is that there's no way employers are going to hold this against anyone because it's, it, you know, it's out with everyone's control. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about that. I would, I would try, I would try and be as positive as I can about about this gap. You know, I think, I think, personally, it's been a great opportunity to be a bit more self reflective and to um, look at my my practice and think about areas of, of, of development. So I think if you can try and express how you've used the time, because I'm sure you've not been idle. Um, so what sort of CPD have you done? Has that Are there themes that are coming through that rather than a huge long list of webinars that you've watched? Are there areas that you feel like you've developed? Um, you know, try try and, and, and make it as positive as, as you can. Um, but, but know that there will be, you know, employers are going to be uh, predisposed to be supportive given the circumstances. I mean, I think I would echo that. We did some research just before Christmas with the Higher Education Institutions Network, sort of addressing this very real concern that, you know, people are going to be seen as lacking skills or, you know, having with, just with the amount of time away from training. And, you know, it was a quick bit of research, but it was sort of unsurprising, you know, employers weren't overly worried by that you know I think people are realistic um I think it's as Julie said it's showing that you've done something you're committed but you know everyone knows how hard it's been um yeah yeah it's the thing it's kind of showing that isn't it mm. um there's a couple of questions which tie in together um with internships um they say, um, how long would you recommend doing internships before searching for professional roles? And there's one very similar about internships, how many you should or could do as a student before before getting a job. Also, there's no set rule, I'm sure, but it's just what's expected in the field or what people found themselves. Well, I'm just gonna jump in because I'm currently doing my third internship since graduating. Um, and I will say I've, looked for full-time work since the day after graduating as well as doing internships I don't think they're mutually exclusive activities I think the role comes up and you're interested in it and you're passionate about the organization even if you just graduate I just go for it go for it get the experience of doing the application and hopefully get an interview and you might get the role um, but at the same time like I've applied for and been successful for a number of internships that have really boosted my skills and confidence and built my connections in the sector so that's also really benefited me um, how many I'm allowed to do I think this is, I think this will probably be my last one I don't think I'll get away with another one before people start wondering why I'm still doing internships I'm honest <laughs> Julie's laughing yeah <laughs> having having been Ariel's intern supervisor twice um <laughs> yeah no I think I, I think that's fair I think you know as I was saying in my presentation you, you you're not necessarily in control of this and you don't necessarily have the choice um and, and as Ariel says, if it's something that you're interested in, th then then go for it. Um, I mean, I, uh, it's a hard one because it, again, it comes down to, for internships, it comes down to that idea that you understand where this fits in your career path and you're able to articulate that clearly. So it's not just a sort of scattergun approach, applying for anything and everything. It, it, it comes across clearly that this is actually an opportunity that you're really keen for. 
before for these reasons you can see where it's going to take you in your career if that comes across then then I don't think you know there's necessarily you know I don't think there's a statute of limitations on on how many you can you can do brilliant and I'd say one more final question just to wrap up if that's all right um and um it asks uh, with what qualifies as cpd obviously as i think patrick mentioned doesn't necessarily have to be to do with um you know conservation in a say but can it be you know what kind of things going to be participating in a webinar um, a short course or are you how can you do a variety basically it, it can literally be anything it really depends on it could be a phone call that could be your cpd um it really doesn't have to be complicated at all um so say, say it again it really depends on what the need is so if it's cpd within a project you know and you're just needing to sort of chat over an idea with someone you know that is cpd as much as going to a big sort of international conference um so it's, you know anything where you develop and you learn something new is cpd um, it could be something from outside of conservation as well. So it could be from voluntary experience, you know, something you might not think is related. But you're, you know, a really good example was from one of our CPD readers for accreditation who practiced her hand skills by kneading bread, you know, and that's, that's probably quite an extreme example. But, you know, she felt it was appropriate. And, you know, I think it is in its own way. Yeah. Brilliant. So um, as we've run a little bit over, um, and I want to give people a little bit of a breather before moving on to the pub, um, I've had a few people ask about recording. Uh, it has been recorded tonight, as the last session was, and eventually we, it will be uploaded onto the Icon YouTube after a little bit of editing. Um, so that will be available for people to, to pursue at their own leisure. Um, I just want to say um, a massive thank you to the three of you for your presentations this evening. Um, and I'm hoping that the questions have been amazing. And, I know I've learned a lot as well. Um, and so I would just like to say that we obviously continue the conversation in the virtual pub at half eight and the link was posted in the chat box, but it can also be found on the ICON website. So um, for now, I'd just like to thank you once again and for everybody who's participated tonight and um, yeah, have a good evening. <laughs>